Welcome to BAMP Center Talks. I'm Mojo Anderson. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with two award-winning crime fiction writers. But the fact that these two authors are described as crime writers might be where the similarities end. We'll have to find out. Sydney, Australia's Michael Robotham was an investigative journalist and a successful ghost writer. He then became a best-selling crime writer with the publication of his 2004 book, The Suspect. He's since published 10 more novels, which have been translated into 23 languages around the globe. His forte is the psychological thriller. His 2014 novel, Life and Death, won the Gold Dagger, and it has been shortlisted for the 2016 Edgar Award. His most recent novel is Close Your Eyes. Louise Welsh hails from the other side of the globe, Glasgow, Scotland. She's the author of seven novels, and they span time from the Elizabethan era of Christopher Marlowe to a dystopian future under the threat of a global pandemic. Her, de her debut in 2002, The Cutting Room, was awarded the crime writer's Creasy Dagger for the best first crime novel. Her most recent book, Death is a Welcome Guest, is the second in her Plague Times trilogy. Combined, the works of Michael and Louise are a marvelous reminder of how diverse and imaginative the crime fiction genre can be. So, Michael, Louise, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'm you. so glad we get to have a chance to talk. Now, both of you came to crime writing from a career in which words mattered. Louise, you were a bookseller. Michael, you were a journalist. And you could have written anything. So why crime fiction? My goodness, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what, by now, you don't know. You know, I think I think I wanted to write something with a very strong story, with a very strong plot, something that was visceral and had extremes of human nature. Um, I was aware that I was engaging with genre, and I was aware of thinking about the gothic genre, of thinking about crime, of thinking about horror. But I wasn't sure that I would be welcomed by the crime fraternity in the way that I was. And it's been a great pleasure in my life to have been embraced by that uh, rather broad church. How about you, Michael? Were you always thinking about crime? No, not at all. I, I write, I, I, my first novel was sold on a part manuscript, and as was Louise's novel, which is quite unusual. And so it was only 117 pages, and I had no idea how it ended. I had no idea it was a crime novel, um, The Suspect. And... And it didn't ever dawn on me until until the novel came out. I knew after it came out that it had a very lot of Hitchcockian sort of suspense elements to it, the wrong man in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I didn't realise I was um, I didn't realise I was becoming a crime writer. And, and the first question you always get asked is why crime. And it took me a long while to be able to answer that. And when I look back through a long career in journalism, there were so many stories I covered where it was all about discovering why something happened and I was always far more interested in the reasons why something happened rather than the actual sort of nuts and bolts of it. Um, and actually the first interview I ever did uh, with, a, with a newspaper and that question came up and somehow the journalist mistook what I said because I wasn't a great crime reader. A lot of crime writers grow up reading Raymond Chandler and reading Agatha Christie or, or just soaking, immersing themselves in the genre. And I wasn't like that at all. And I'd actually tried to tell this guy that I'd... Oh, the headline read, the crime writer who's only read one crime novel. <laughs> and this is, a, this is a headline that haunted me because everywhere I went after that, I was the first question for any journalist was which one? Because they assumed it had to be the best crime novel in the world or the worst one because why would you give up after one? But in fact, I tried to say, listen, there are so many wonderful writers in the genre that I'd sort of try to read one of each. You know, one Ian Rankin and one George Pelicanos and one James Lee Burke. You know, um, but yeah, I didn't realise I was—I uh, didn't realise I was sort of becoming a crime writer. Louise, your books don't really typify the crime writing genre. You sort of break all the boundaries and things. But I think storytelling is storytelling. So, what ingredients does a compelling crime story need to have? Goodness, I think I think storytelling is at the heart of it. And this week uh, at the BAMP Centre, and we've been talking all about what makes a, a crime novel, what makes a crime story. And I think it's, I don't know, we should probably ask um, our fellow writers in the audience, but I think it boils down perhaps to really compelling characters and a really, really good story. And I think at the, the heart of... All of my novels, I think, is a, a quest. Mm -hmm. And that quest is often for 
something that has happened, for the, 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 the truth as we can possibly know it about something that has happened. But it's an emotional quest as well. So in the very uh, first crime novel that I wrote, uh, The Cutting Room, the quest is to find out, did something happen? Did uh, some very horrible photographs actually get taken? Do they exist? Um, so there's not always a body at the heart of, of my fiction, but there is always a quest. There's usually a body. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think it was Peter James that said that only murder will do, you know, and uh, I was fascinated by the idea. It's, um, and that's not to say that all crime ro- novels have to have a murder, but it does, it does sort help. of... help. It does up the ante a little bit. I mean, she always said it was, a, it was murder because it's the only crime that you cannot make recompense for. You cannot make it better or change it or take it back to the way it was. It is so final. And also her belief was that we were all, each and every one of us were capable of murder in the right circumstances. We all had that darkness in us and it's why I think we love to explore the dark side in, and read this genre. So what makes the difference between a great story and a good story? Oh, do you know, I think it's the characters. You know, because in the end there's a limited number of stories. And, you know, a number of times that I've, I've launched into doing a novel and I think I've come up with this completely unique idea that no one has ever written this. And in the course of, in the course of, of, of writing it, I think one book, The Night Fairy, where I discovered Don Leon had, had read the same story I had and written a novel on the same sort of area, um, completely different. So in a sense, you realise that there are, there are a limited number of stories, mm. potentially, but an unlimited number of characters and that the impact and, the, and how a crime can ripple through a family or a community, that's something you, there's endless scope to investigate. Mm. It is in the way that you tell the story, though, as well, isn't it? Because um, I think, like me, we all come... Many of us are lucky enough to come from uh, families of storytellers and we know that there are particular people in the family, when they begin to tell their story, you think, oh, no, here we go. <laughs> this is not... This is going to just take up time. And, and then there are other people, when they begin to tell their story, you relax and, you're, you know, you know that you're going to be entranced. So I think the way in which we tell the story is key because you could have the most exciting narrative badly told. It's nothing. So we're going to get a little bloody here. (laughs) Both of you have written stories at the hearts of which there are acts of violence. I mean, there has to be a mystery or a crime of some sort, but how important is violence to crime fiction? Oh, it's interesting. Um, I think it's a, you know, I, I've tried very hard. I and mean, there have been some violent acts in my books, but a lot, a lot of my books are very psychologically dark. The body counts are very low. It's all, I try to engender the fear of, you know, that idea of people wanting to, you know, check the doors and the windows and before they start, start reading. I mean, my wife, I think I wrote a book called Shatter and um, my wife would only read it in the daylight. And she said afterwards that I'd never been, we'd never be invited to dinner again because no one would have a sick bastard like me in the house. <laughs> but it's, it's, it, was, it was a book, I think there were, two, there were two deaths in the book. It was just psychologically, the whole premise of it was psychologically dark. Um, I certainly think, you know, I think the, the books have to have jeopardy, they have to have risks, they have to have suspense. So the stakes have to be high. I think you need all of those elements. I'm not a huge fan of those books that are just um, blood-soaked and steeped in violence. And I mean, someone like Thomas Harris can write, you know, Science of the Lambs is one of the best written crime novels ever, beautifully written. I mean, the language is amazing. There are other people that try to outdo him in violence and they're just nowhere near as good a writer as as Thomas Harris was. And um, it is just blood-soaked and gratuitous. It's very easy to write, just um, violence, you know, to do a, a descriptive scene that is uh, disgusting or horrible. I get, violence exists in the real world and I think when it is in a novel, perhaps we should feel it. But um, for me, I get very tired of books that turn on the dead, female, naked, tortured body and it's something that I don't particularly See, want mine. to do. That's my tie that's stick you. on. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. You, bo- you do both um, excel in psychological suspense, 
more than violence. But, Michael, I do want to go back to what you said about Shatter because I, I remember reading that you said the emotional toll of writing that novel made you vow that you would never delve into very dark territory again. I'd get, the reason I said that was that was the first book where I'd ever written from the point of view of the villain. Uh, and so that was a dual narrative, two first-person accounts. And so the story behind that um, was a very, it's based on a true story, a very chilling story of a man who could, with very little information, convince women that he had kidnapped their child. I mean, just simply by knowing what school they went to and what uniform they wore and a little bit about them, had enough information to phone them at home and convince them they'd kidnapped their, their child. And, uh, and if you have even 1% of you thinks that they could be telling the truth as a parent, you will beg and plead and you'll offer to take that child's place. And it's based on a true story. It was sort of mentally destroying someone. But to write those scenes, to write those scenes from that, and I actually, there's a section in that book where one of the real victims that underwent this, because this particular man targeted 600 women, and one of them managed to record what he said on her answering machine, and I use verbatim the language he used, and the description is actually, and I found writing those scenes incredibly disturbing, and I would, and I think sometimes being a writer, particularly I think when you write in the first person, but not always, it's like in, being an actor and you inhabit the skin of your character, and I would have the scalding hot shower and I would crawl into bed and curl up and want the voice to get out of my head. And I did feel as though I would never go back and have a villain as, a, as tell a villain story in the first person again. Louise, is there anything you can't or won't write about? I'm not a great fan of the serial killer and I'm not mm. a great fan of the, uh, the novel where it turns out that somebody behaved in this way simply because they were mad. I actually find it quite offensive, novels where it turns out that uh, that somebody acted in this way simply because they were a psychopath, they were crazy. Um, and I think mental illness is something that exists in the world. Uh, people who are mentally ill are usually, you know, in, in torment themselves. They're not usually going out and conceiving elaborate ways to, to kill people over and over and over again. So I guess that's one of my... Little uh, bugbears. I'm not keen on them. Um, I'm not keen on blaming the mad. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. I was, I was um, years ago. I was interviewed with a wonderful Australian writer called Peter Temple and asked about if there was any taboo area. And not writer, crime writers are often asked, is that if there's any, is there any point where you would think I would never go there? And and Peter's comment was that uh, he could boil a baby and eat it with truffles. And that would be I've fine. I've done that, actually. Have you? In the, fiction, know, in the fictional I, world, yes. yes. <laughs> but heaven help you if you harm a family pet. <laughs> and uh, and, I, and, I, and I, I tested this theory in one of my books and um, where a particular Labrador called Gunsmoke um, uh, had, a, had a grisly end. And it's led to more hate mail than I've ever received mm. before. <laughs> Most horrendous, horrendous hate mail. Oh, no. My own mother rang me <laughs> and demanded that I change it. Because she said, I spent the entire rest of the book thinking the cat was going to be next. <laughs> <laughs> well, back to a more serious aspect. I do remember being very upset when I read that passage where the dog was killed. I did. Woven into the fabrics of your books are issues of, of social concern, domestic violence, sexual abuse, societal breakdown, apocalyptic viruses... <laughs> <laughs> so, just a few lighthearted I have topics. I, honestly, you read Louise's book and you will have nightmares about, you know, viruses. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but that makes me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> but I kill dogs and you kill entire populations. <laughs> yes. No, there's a few. There are some people left, Ross. So it would be oh. a very short book. <laughs> At least you have a third one coming, so we know there are some people there's left. There's hope. Yeah. There's always yeah. hope. <laughs> but do you see your writing, this is a question for both of you, do you see your writing as having a moral viewpoint? And if so, how do you write a novel that has a moral viewpoint but isn't moralistic? I think it comes back to what Louise said earlier. It comes back to story. It starts a story. And the moment you begin to preach, the moment you begin writing with any form of moral viewpoint or, or bandwagon that you want to, or drum that you want to beat, then you are probably going to be in trouble Whereas if you just stick to telling a compelling story and uh, invariably, you know, if there are messages in there, you know, they, they emerge. 
I think it's interesting. Your politics, the politics of the writer emerges. It's why I get into, you know, it's in a sense in life or death, I think there's a line in it when I suggest that in Texas, uh, the, one of the reasons they don't execute the brain dead is because too many of their politicians would have to die. Um, <laughs> And, and, and that led to quite a few angry people from Texas sending me messages, you know. Uh, it was one line in a book, but in the end, I think um, the message gets across. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's true. If you want to write a manifesto, write a manifesto. But uh, Michael's quite right. Our politics are hardwired within us and inevitably uh, there are messages in there. I, have, I must say that I have all sorts of really hard-hitting uh, intelligent and political messages within my books, but nobody ever notices. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tamburlaine Must Die, your brilliant novel about Christopher Marlowe, um, if you would talk about that in terms of asylum seekers and how a novel set in Elizabethan England has relevance today. It, it does, and that's nice of you to, to say that. The Tamburlaine Must Die is set during the 15th century, and it's a time when lots of people are coming from elsewhere into London and uh, the, the Elizabethan Londoners don't like this. And I did write a, at, uh, I guess, the, the beginning of a point where we seem to have a lot of immigration and um, lo and behold, a lot of people in Britain didn't like it. And I guess the, the book is, in a sense, an allegory about this. Um, and it was great. I got a, a really, really lovely... A review in the Times where the Times reviewer said, well, it would be a hard stretch to call Louise Welsh a political writer. But, you know, you could kind of see this as an allegory for, our <laughs> for this political aspect of our times. And I guess in a way, um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to <laughs> tell a story. But a historical novel, I think, only has power if it's relevant also to our times. We want mm. to, as readers, be able to dream ourselves onto the page. And the same is true, of course, also of a slightly speculative novel, um, which the one that I'm writing just now is. It's only set five years in the future. Things have not changed a great deal, <laughs> it has to be said. <laughs> Apart from the plague. Apart from the plague, but, you know, that's on its... <laughs> that, I think that may be on its way, actually. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to talk about maybe the mechanics of, of writing, in particular the voice of the character, how you find characters. So what comes first, the character or the crime? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, all, all, of, all of my books have been seated in real life events. Uh, and it's often as a journalist, it's something it's like Life or Death was a, a, a paragraph, that two paragraph story I read 20 years ago. Uh, about a man who escaped from prison the day before he was due to be released. And if, the obvious question is, why? And for, for, for 20 years I kept that paragraph and for about 10 years trying to work out why someone would do that. He'd served, he'd served two, two life sentences and since he'd killed two people. Why would you escape the day before you're due to be released? And it took me about 10 years to come up with a reason. And, um, and I guess to me it's normally a seed like that. It's, it's, it's the seed of a story and then I will think of what characters are best to tell that story. And when it comes to voice, I guess, you know, my background as a, as a ghostwriter, you know, I did 15 autobiographies for the, for the great and the, and the good and, and the less good. Um, and, um, yeah, thank you, Rolf. Um, the, um, uh, and it was... It was all about, that was all about capturing a voice, capturing their voice so well that no one would see my fingerprints anywhere on, that it was, there was a ghostwriter involved at all. And I, I, I think I approach fiction writing the same way. I try to create characters that live and breathe in my mind and they are real people. Uh, and, uh, and the, and, but I think the seed of the story comes first. Well, let's talk about your character, Joe O'Loughlin, for just a minute in terms of voice. And how did he come to be this incredibly believable character. I think partly he, in a sense, his knowledge is based on a man called Paul Britton. I was, uh, I, I ghostwrote two books with a man called Paul Britton. He's a forensic psychologist. I'm sure many people here remember the wonderful series Cracker, you know, where Robbie Coltrane played a, a psychologist. Uh, well, um, Cracker was based upon the work of Paul Britton. Um, and so he worked on cases like the Fred and Rosemary West case and the Jamie Bolger case and many, many celebrated crimes in the UK. And uh, having worked with Paul, that's where the idea of having a psychologist came. 
And, and I can remember the moment, the voice of Joe, because Joe O'Loughlin is nothing like the real life character of Paul Britton. They're completely different. But, you know, I created Joe O'Loughlin and gave him early onset Parkinson's. I wanted this man with a brilliant mind, but a crumbling body. And I remember the moment that I captured his voice because I was trying to think, how, what's he going to sound like? You know, what's he going to be like? And, yeah, and it was going to be first person. And, he, and I wrote a paragraph which said, you know, from Joe O'Loughlin's point of view, I know what sort of day it's going to be if I wake up in the morning, can bend down and tie my shoes. And I thought, that's his voice. That sort of self-deprecating little sort of, even in the face of all that adversity, that's his voice. Louise, you have protagonists ranging from a magician, a comedian, and a woman who sells products on a shopping channel. So you have to channel a lot of different people. <laughs> you know, but there's a connection with all of these uh, characters, though, and I think that connection is performance, um, which sales, I don't know if there's any sales people in the audience. Um, my dad, when he was uh, working, he's retired now, was a, a salesman. And I think that idea of going out and selling on television or being a, a conjurer or all of the, a comedian, they're actually, there are real points of contact there because you have to get up and you have to perform and you have to uh, believe very much in what you're doing. And I guess the thing that we do as creative artists, as creative writers, is not so different. And mm. um, we're asking the, the readers to come with us in the way that uh, the salesperson will ask the people they're trying to sell to to come with you. And I think... Uh, like conjuring as well, as you said. Con- that, that yeah. idea we, that we sort of try to plant a clue with one hand and they don't see what our oh other hand is goodness. doing. It is. Yeah. And people step towards you because from about the age of three, four, five, we know that magic doesn't exist and yet, and yet, we enjoy the conjurer's act. And uh, when I did that book, um, oh gosh, the bullet trick, I uh, I decided I was going to learn how to do table magic. And I was going to spend a lot of time doing it. So I would have been able to say to you, Michael, what's the time? And you would look and your watch would be gone because I would have already <laughs> stolen it and smashed it up with a hammer and then represent it to you. You know, I couldn't do any of it because oh, I no. wasn't... I wasn't committed enough to it. It's really, really difficult. And I guess the other thing about that is obsession. You have to be quite obsessed to do these things. So I think all of our characters, all of us actually, have an obsession that we want to pursue. And that's perhaps the other part of the quest as well. Well, I did think reading both of your works, um, they, there was a bit of magician and conjurer and certainly psychologist, if you think how much like Joe you might be. I think Joe is, um, Joe is a bit of wish fulfillment going there. Um, he's, uh, it, it, now, probably of all the characters I've created, Joe Lachlan is, is closest to me in age and he's, uh, he's got um, two daughters, I've got three daughters and we've probably got a very similar outlook on the world and very similar... Um, you know, political sort of viewpoints. He's far cleverer than I am. You know, far braver than I am. Oh my God, I would never do what he does. So that's where the wish fulfillment comes in. Um, uh, yeah, no, I think that's where you know. I think that's what that you can allow you allow yourself to do that a little bit. I mean, I'm a complete and utter coward. I'm my mother's son. My mother once screamed so loudly in a cinema. They stop the film and turn the lights up. Okay, <laughs> that is me. I hate scary films. I hate you know. Um, yeah. You've, you've said, Louise, I, I, I'm switching gears here, but you've said, Louise, in a lot of genre novels, there's a lot of really interesting, clever stuff, but we feel we can all read it. So by genre novels, you mean crime writing and things. So what kind of clever things are going on in that genre now? Oh, my goodness. You know, I think, uh, I think crime novels are as... Um, inventive structurally and intertextually and in, in terms of characterization as um, any literary novel, the, the best of the genre, of course. Um, but I guess part of what I meant by that was uh, I want to read, I, I want to write books that people feel they can read, that people feel they can read on the top of the bus, so that they won't look and think, gosh, well, that looks a little bit worthy, doesn't it? Um, so I, I think at the... You know, at the, heart, at the heart of my writing, perhaps I want also to entertain. And we, we do have our politics, we do have our, uh, our ambitions, you know, as, as literary writers. But I also want to be um, somebody that, uh, that book that gets shoved in the holiday bag or um, is the escape 
when yeah. you're having a, a terrible, terrible day at work and you think, never mind, at the end of today, I'll get on the tram or I'll get on the bus and I'll escape for a little while. Yeah, My biggest true. ambition is that people forget to pick their children up from school because they're far too busy reading my book yeah. or they let the potatoes boil over or, you know, something, something. They get sacked Don't you worry a little <laughs> because bit they were reading my book in the drawer. Don't you worry a little bit when <laughs> someone sends you a little message through your website and says, I was up until four o'clock in the morning reading your book and I, you know, and I forgot to get up and get the kids to school. And you're thinking, should we? Should they come with a warning about operating heavy machinery after <laughs> after reading these books? Do you think? Um, I think it's um, no. You're absolutely right. It's it's. I think this is crime is an incredibly broad church. You know, within this genre, there are books that you read but don't inhale. You know, and there are other books that will. I'm not saying they'll change your life. A great, great literary novel may well change your life. Uh, a great crime novel is a sort of book that will stay with you for days afterwards and you'll want to rush out and put it in the hand of a friend and say, you must read this. And they are, as Graham Greene described them, entertainments and they, and I think they serve a huge and important purpose because people, they do, they do tend to have lives where they're time poor and their things don't go well. But the idea that they can escape, whether mm. it be on the top of the bus or at, at home when, the, you know, when they turn the TV, they, they can escape for a few hours into a novel is... is um, Hugely flattering if it's your book that they choose to read. It's great, isn't it? And, I, and of course, there are lots of um, so-called literary novels that we might say are actually crime novels. Um, one of the books we mentioned this week was Albert Camus' uh, L'Etranger, the, the Outsider. What is that if not a crime novel, if not a meditation on uh, justice and injustice? There's, there's, there's so many novels that I think are... Um, and I'm not making great calls for, for my book, I'm not saying... Uh, that this is great literary writing, but so many great literary novels do have these themes at their heart. I've been a reader my entire life, been in the book world my entire life, but I truly don't understand why your books aren't considered literary because they are brilliant. I mean, you're incredible. Both of you are incredible yeah, writers. You. Oh, nice. So you've won all sorts of awards, but... It seems that no crime novel has ever been nominated for a literary award it's, like the Man Booker. Well, it's interesting because Peter Temple, who I mentioned uh, mentioned earlier when I mentioned the killing of animals, um, Peter was actually he won the Miles Franklin in Australia, which is our top um, top literary award, and and from, as far as I know, it's the first time anywhere in the world that a crime writer has won a country's top literary award, and um, the chair of the Man Booker was asked after that, upon this, whether he could foresee a crime writer in the UK ever even being shortlisted for the booker. And he said, that would be like putting a car horse in the Grand National, which was just... What a rude man. What a rude, rude, rude That was rude terribly man. rude. But, you know, OK... <laughs> 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 I, do think, um, I do think as writers we shouldn't really be thinking about these things. Mm. I think we should just be getting up, yes. going to our desk writing the best books that we can and hoping they get made into movies so we can get a pension. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, just writing the best thing that we possibly can. And uh, Robert Burns says, you know, the rank is but the guinea stamp. We, we shouldn't be worrying about prizes and so forth. What we should be worrying about is writing the best mm. possible book that we can. And uh, we can get snared up in these things, you know. Well, I, I agree that you shouldn't be worrying about that. But as a bookseller and as a reader, I can be worrying about that when I think of how many stunning books you've written that and they wouldn't be eligible. For. I think you should put that man booker judge in one of the novels and kill him <laughs> kill off. Him, kill him in a terrible way. I've got to tell you a story. Uh, it's quite a few years ago now, about 10 or 15 years ago now, a, um, a, a woman writer who had been shortlisted for the man booker um, uh, sued. It, she was living in in Cornwall in a little cottage, and she sued a plumbing company for installing a a, fo a faulty gas boiler. And because of the fault in this gas boiler, gas fumes were coming into her writing room. And because of these fumes, she was incapable of finishing her literary novel and could only write a crime novel. <laughs> <laughs> and she won thirty five thousand pounds. Wow. wow! I don't think I don't I don't even even she could get away with that today. But mm -hmm. yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm going to go back in time for a minute, and I'm I'm pretending I'm Joseph O'Loughlin, the psychologist, and and say, ask what spark was the source 
that made you writers? When did you know? I think you said you knew. Oh, my, mine, very mine early. was mine was. You know, I know exactly that moment, and and uh, and Louise, I know Louise knows the story. I, I was. Um, 11 years old and I discovered the work of Ray Bradbury and, uh, and I wrote him. You could only get four Bradbury titles in Australia at that point and I'd finished them all and I wrote him a letter from my little tiny country town called Gundagai um, where it had a population of about 400 people and I wrote a letter to Ray Bradbury, care of Random House, New York. I didn't put a stamp. From memory, I didn't even put a stamp on the envelope <laughs> and, uh, and three months passed and I came home from primary school and there on the kitchen table was a package wrapped in brown paper and containing the four Ray Bradbury titles that weren't available and a letter from the great man himself saying how thrilled he was to have a young reader on the far side of the world. And I think that, that was the generosity, I think. That was the moment I knew I, knew I wanted to be a writer. Um, and I just want to just add to the little bit that the postscript to that was that a few years ago uh, I wrote that story up for an American magazine and I called... I quoted Ray Bradbury. Ray Bradbury once said that Jules Verne was his literary father and Mary Shelley was his literary mother and Edgar Allan Poe was the batwing cousin they kept locked in the attic. (laughs) And I said that Ray Bradbury was my literary father and that Steinbeck and Hemingway were my overachieving older brothers. And this story appeared in a magazine and was republished on the website and about a week later I got an email from Alexandra Bradbury who was Ray's youngest daughter. I had no idea he was still alive and she sent me a message saying my father is 91 years old and he's now completely blind. But I read him the story that you wrote and I wanted you to know that you made an old man cry oh. and he wanted you to know that you are his son. Oh, how oh. nice. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. That's, yeah. That is really, really beautiful. Yeah. You make us cry. Yeah. Louise, I, I think I read that you were writing when you were very young but then you stopped in your teens. I think it's, I think it's something that a lot of people do. You know, you write a lot when you're little and I wrote, I think I had a, my peak my peak production period was when I was probably about 14 years old and I wrote lots and lots and lots and lots of poems do you still about have how, them? I think my dad still has them yeah I, I wrote lots of poems about how shit it is to be 14 years old <laughs> and how nobody knows nobody has ever experienced this misery and dreadful but you know and then and then after that, I just went out dancing every night for about 15 years and just <laughs> loved it. So I think there's a whole period of, uh, of my life that was predicated around nightclubs and dancing and having a really good time. And then round about the, towards the, my late 20s, I started to write again. And I wouldn't say that any of those nights were wasted, but it maybe would have been an idea just to practice my craft a little bit. <laughs> have you ever gone back and read any of it? That you wrote when you were fourteen, no, or is it all? Is, you think it'd no, be too self-indulgent? I would have to kill myself. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't. No. <laughs> so it's very unlikely that the hero or several of the good characters in the book books are going to die. But what keeps us going if we know that there's going to be a relatively happy ending? What is it that you do, each of you, I, that keeps us going? No, I think. Well, in a case, it it. Uh, your, main, your protagonist has to have skin in the game. It has to be personal. In most of my cases, in, in the case of Joe O'Loughlin or in, in the standalone something like Life or Death, it, it is, you know, for the characters, um, it is life-threatening and not everyone will survive. I mean, you sort of know that not everyone is going to get out of it necessarily and, uh, and it's, it's not, it's, you have to have a reason. When you're writing a book like this, you know, if, if you're going to send the character into a, into a dark warehouse at 3 o'clock in the morning, there's got to be a reason for that because if they could have gone in at 10 o'clock in the morning and got the entire police force <laughs> to go with them, the reader's going to go, why are they doing that? But if you can create suspense, if you can generate that sort of pace and give a reason why you can, the reader can understand why someone has to do that, then they will feel the hair on the back of their neck rise up and they will actually experience all of that fear and tension. Um, yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's manipulating readers' emotions terribly. <laughs> It's a magic trick, it is, really, isn't, isn't it? it? You know, as a little child, I remember I'd go to the shops with my granny and sometimes on the way back we would meet someone and they'd say, what were you doing today, Billy? And she would tell them what we'd been doing and I would listen and I would think, gosh, I didn't know we had such an exciting time. <laughs> <laughs> and that came down to the, the way in which she would tell the story, you know. And it wasn't made up, it wasn't lying, but, um, but gosh, it was better when she told it than when we lived it. <laughs> <laughs> 
So can you give us a bit of uh, a hint as to what's coming down the pipes from both of you? Oh. Just a wee hint. Well, you're doing the third. Just you're you're finishing hint. up the trilogy, the Death, the destruction, pestilence, <laughs> and uh, a lot of laughs. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm finishing the third part of the, the Plague Times trilogy. Um, we're five years in the future. Uh, a lot of a lot of people have died, <laughs> and um, the it begins on the islands of Orkney, and uh, children are leaving the islands. Children have gone missing, and it's uh, the the protagonists are going in search of the children. So yes, yeah, so so in a way, in a way, it's a very old story. It's one of the, and this is perhaps something else that we do. We explore the the deepest fears that people have. And one of the deepest fears is the children going, the children leaving. This is a, a fairy story in a way, although it's set in the uh, in the impossible future. So as you can tell from some of the conversation this evening, both Louise and Michael are very funny. So here you write these very dark books, but you do have humor throughout. How essential is that for you to be writing it and how essential is it in the novels? I think it's I think it's a very dreary book that in no time allows the reader a moment to smile or a moment to laugh. Um, but I think you know, obviously, as we all know, the darkness is only you know we need light in order for there to be darkness as well, and mm. laughter is part of life. It, it does. You can if you're going to, if you're going to write a book where you you know it is going the tension is going to be high and you're going to you do have to have the reader give the reader a chance to relax and sometimes smile and laugh and it's uh, um, and uh, no it's a, it is, and it is about you're actually right it is about the darkness is darker if you can create light in there as well yep but as Lone Cheney says nobody laughs at a clown after midnight <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to explain what that means later. <laughs> After, After midnight. midnight. <laughs> After midnight. <laughs> well, you've given us both uh, glimpses into darkness and lightness, so thank you very much. That's the end of this BAMP Centre talk. I've been speaking with writers Michael Robotham and Louise Welsh. Remember, you can watch more talks and download podcast versions on the BAMP Centre website, bampcentre.ca. I'm Mojo Anderson. Thanks for watching. <laughs>